The world unfolds differently for each of us. Why? Where do the rules come from? Within each of us, there is a unique philosophy shaping our thoughts, beliefs, feelings, worldviews, and actions. This is Inner Dialogues with Ejem, an introspective space for curious souls and minds. This is where you get to understand your individual philosophy that writes the script of your life. This is where we unveil the inner wisdom that guides you. Yep, that was your inner sage knocking the door. Let's go and chat with him. Hi, it's Ajem. Welcome back to New Dialogues with me. The topic for today's episode came to me when I was driving last week. For like a brief second, my mind made the connection between two things. And I was like, right, it has always been there in front of my eyes. And then the following day, I said something to my friend, which reminded me of something else that I realized in my previous job. Finally, last night, I realized that these three things are actually connected. And they're under the same umbrella. Remember, the second step of my release, remember, discover, reflect, embrace framework. I want to say one more time that... I'm so happy that I got to create this framework because it is like the formula or mathematics behind our beings, like how we quote unquote learn things, how we again quote unquote self grow in general, how we work towards to our own self actualization, toward living an authentic, intuitive life. So let's start. Let's go chronologically before I get too excited and confuse all of us. In my previous job, one of the things we were doing is to create workshops for the activities of our approved projects. They could have been brief online ones or in per- in in person workshops during a a couple of days long project trip. My go my colleague at that time and I were creating a series of workshop for the duration of 10 days long project trip. After some point, things could get repetitive and ideas could have felt limited, of course. In our brainstormings and creating process of workshops, she said something like, in one of the resources I looked up, they did this kind of a workshop or they did this kind of an evaluation at the end of the workshop. I thought we can tweak it like this and use it in our workshop or reading that gave me this idea to implement in our workshop. Hearing her saying that first gave me a relief. <laughs> and then one time I shared with her, I said to her something like, I didn't know that you also read other sources research things and through that you've been writing these wonderful projects coming up with these creative activities and planning these detailed workshops it may sound quite normal and wise thing to do as you're listening to it right now but I think at that time it was a revelation moment for me because I think I got to face with one of my deep core assumptions which can be worded as If someone is creative and coming up with this unique, wonderful projects, products, ideas, they must have sit by themselves and pour out what they already wanted to create. I think I assumed that people who create something start with a clear vision of what they want to create and they have all the ideas painting that vision available to them as if they are choosing what to wear from their wardrobe. I know it is the case for some people and it is even the case for me in some situations. I'm going to come to that in a minute, but before that, I want to tap into how I felt at that moment. When my ex-colleague was referring to her research and how she formed that idea she was mentioning to me, I felt a relief because I think I was no longer feeling like a fraud. I was not cheating. I was not 
copy and pasting, I was learning, brain brainstorming. In general, what I like to call now, I was stimulating my brain by being exposed to other minds out there. And I always been like that. I've never been good at drawing without looking at other examples of the things I want to draw. I'm good and patient with technology, with designing things and editing, but most of the time I need examples of designs or even templates. Even when I used to write philosophy papers, sometimes I had an argument from the very beginning, a claim that I can support and argue for, But sometimes I had to find my position within that topic by reading a bunch of other academic work. Creativity doesn't require isolation. I think what it requires is the stimulation of our brains, bending of our reality a bit and stirring the water of our being. I'm asking myself, what caught me in that moment when my ex-colleague told me how she formed her idea for that workshop activity, whatever. Of course, I had people telling me, based on my research, I found this and we can implement it in this way. I had people like that many times, but I think the tweak for me there was the intentionality of Dedicating time and energy to learn and understand how other people might have done. What I saw in my ex-colleague at that time was this intentionality. She mindfully and consciously dedicated her time to read stuff, research things, things that even seem unrelated to the final product. She was reading Listening, researching with pure curiosity to understand how others might have done and thought. As I'm saying this and describing what I understood from her behavior, it reminded me of a line from the book that I'm currently reading. The book is called Designing the Mind, The Principles of Psychitecture by Ryan A. Bush. I think it is a wonderful book combining modern psychology with ancient philosophy. I'm waiting it to settle within me so that I can further create something with it. In the last chapter that I read, there was the following sentence about what philosophy is. Quote, The word philosophy literally means love of wisdom. Originally, philosophers were concerned about all with living a good life. And studying the ideas of these thinkers can vastly increase your capacity to do so. Studying the ideas and values of other thinkers may seem like it would only indoctrinate us to their ways of thinking. But the thoughts of others can give us great insight into our own minds. End quote. What my ex-colleague did at that time I think was purely going after wisdom. She was purely curious about what other minds can show her. Isn't this studying what others think and understand? Isn't this being a lover of wisdom and acting with this intention? As we talked in previous episodes, purely going after wisdom and understanding can surprise us with gifts of deep understanding and authentic creations within. I had a coaching session yesterday with a new client and when I asked her at the end of the session, what are you looking forward in our coaching journey? And she said, the tweak that will happen in my perspective through your questions, reflections and sharing, the ability to see a different side of my own perspective is really exciting for me. Isn't this wonderful? Being open to challenge our own views, complement them with further ones, and eventually being open to other minds is surrendering and accepting wisdom and its calling. The excitement you feel toward this surrendering and challenging your perspective is the real fuel for self-actualization.
or self-growth, if you like to call it. We dove deeper about being a lover of wisdom and in a constant pursuit of wisdom and gifts of it and the whole dynamic it will create in our lives in episode 17. It was a very special episode for me. I'd love for you to listen to it. The link will be in the description. So this is my take on what my ex-colleague said to me when she was creating workshops. She was humble and open-minded to learn from others, which stimulated her authentic creativity to come up with her own ideas and mash it with what she saw in other minds. I want to take a step take this a step further. Remember, I committed to go chronologically among my realizations. The next on the line is when I when I connected the dots when I was driving last week, week. For a brief second, my brain found a connection between my love for holding deep conversations and quote-unquote learning from other minds. What I would say is that although I'm an introvert, my brain is almost an extrovert. (laughs) Hear me out. Because I think it is in need of a regular stimulation in order to give birth to the things I inhabit inside of me. I shared my why for what I'm doing with this podcast and coaching. I love deep conversations. I realized a lot in them. I reflected so much about myself through them. Now, I feel like in that brief second behind that veil, I found a further deeper why for love of my, for my love of deep conversations. I think deep conversations is my form of learning from other minds and I even say it is the case for almost all of us we are social animals it doesn't matter how much introvert we are we stimulate our brains through interaction with other people experiences teachings and objects and when we share and listen from an all accepting perspective the humble doors of again quote-unquote learning from other minds becomes wide open. Why I constantly say quote-unquote learning is because of what we have discussed many times before. I think there is a constant recollection of what we already know. And in order to recollect, we we need to stir the water. Nothing that is worth knowing can be told. It has to be remembered. That's what I stand for. We can stir our water by exposing ourselves to different experiences, places that we haven't been before. So traveling or interaction with people, trying out new food or reading a variety of stuff. These are all stimulations for our brains, I'd even say for our whole being. Sometimes stimulation looks like taking a break, lying down and resting. Sometimes it looks like assigning ourselves with a repetitive task like ironing, cleaning, showering, driving. Driving was the case for me in connecting these dots. So that our minds can flow and simmer the thoughts from before. Sometimes stimulation looks like being in a conversation with someone where you share what you think, how you feel and hear what the other person is experiencing And through that, you got to explore the echoes of their experiences and sharing with you. The first one, which is taking a break and slowing down, is what we have talked before about giving ourselves time to let things simmer so that they can give birth to further flourishing. The second one, which is doing a repetitive task, is again the same idea of simmering our thoughts and stimulations, but this time with a tweak of keeping our bodies busy. The last one, which is basically being in a conversation or what I like to call holding a deep conversation, is the active form of stimulation for me. In this case, we are open to receive what other minds are holding within themselves. We are open to see our reflections on them. We are open to remember 
what we already know through being exposed to what they have to share with us. In episode five, we talked thoroughly about the technique that Socratic dialogues use, the Mayutic method. I also created a recent Instagram post about it. I'll share both of them in the description. The whole message of the Mayotic method is, I don't know anything, so I cannot teach you anything. I can just arise your thoughts that are already inside you. And this is why, for me, being exposed to other minds through books, courses, conversations, in whatever form it is, is not learning, but more remembering. What we are doing here as well is the third type of stimulation, no? You are being exposed, me sharing my mind and thoughts which stimulate introspection within you. We stir the water of your being and see what comes up and stays on the surface for you to focus on and take with you. Being exposed to the thoughts and sharings of others give us a great opportunity to acquire valuable insights into our own mind, intentions and dreams. The logic behind the way my ex-colleague and I created workshops is the same logic with deep conversations. You go after wisdom, you open yourself to other minds and it stimulates what you hold inside. You tap into your authentic creative force. Exposure to other minds stirs, stirs the water of our being, which stimulates the things inside of us to be born. Your soul, your inner sage, core essence, whatever you want to call it, knows everything anyway. All you need is to give them birth when the time comes. When the time comes. When does the time come, by the way? That is a downside of stimulation and exposure to other minds. When we go after wisdom and stimulate ourselves with other minds, it creates a deep awareness within us because it directs us to introspection. But there is a tendency to incubate. Remember how we started the whole podcast journey, episode one? That is the one. Realization without action is incubation. Revelation without action is incubation. Transformation without action is not possible. We would get lost and end up not knowing what to do with all that aware awareness and all those realization if we don't create a ground for us to practice on and to allow our realizations and awareness to be embodied with intentional action. You held a lovely conversation with your friend. Now, your brain is full of ideas to implement, dreams to go after, right? We've all been there. Or you read a self-help book or signed up for a course and you're so inspired and qualified with all that knowledge you acquired because you opened yourself to other minds and it took you back to your childlike curiosity and excitement. But now it is action time, big or small. Without incubating too much, we should implement what we are stimulated with. That is the downside of stimulation. It can lead to incubation, not taking action, constantly looking for a stimulation and trying out different modalities and external tools and not knowing what to do as well with all the things you quote unquote learned but more so remembered. During these times an external reflective eye becomes a key. It allows us not to get lost while keeping ourselves in the stimulation zone whether through resting, simmering our thoughts while keeping our bodies busy or holding deep conversations. Coaching is the third one. It allows people to discover how they function and provides them a space to explore their functionings while keeping them on the path of their goals and aspirations. It's a conscious space for people to remember their inner wisdom and the ways they'll make use of it in their lives. 
It's a reflective space for people to intentionally take actions aligned with their inner wisdom. If you like to experience a one-on-one coaching space with me, I'm offering free coaching calls this month, especially for heart-driven, intuitive people who have been doing the self-work but feeling stuck and lost with their lives, although they feel like there's a deeper meaning and more to create with their lives. If this is you, or this reminds you of someone you know, get in contact with me. You'll find the details in the description. How have I been doing so far when it comes to going chronologically? Not bad, right? Lovely. Let's connect the dots once again. What my lovely ex-colleague was doing at that time when she was creating a workshop was to open herself to other minds and to go after wisdom which stimulated her authentic creativity and lead her to remember what she has inside. The mathematics behind deep conversations is also the same. We hold ourselves humble enough to experience other minds and see what they get to share which creates further openings in our own ecosystem. We tap into the answer we already have inside. We remember our truths and all the answers that our inner sage is giving us. That was a realization for me from last night. I was like, going after wisdom, be a lover of wisdom, so philosophy, learning from other minds, ending up creating an authentic end product in whatever form. Then this is all remembering the second step of the framework. This was the inside of my mind for a brief second. I hope I got to share it clearly with you. I have to say that I searched for a name in literature for this type of learning, quote-unquote learning, but I couldn't find anything. I feel like there was a name for it. But anyway, if I come across later, I'll update the episode definition and share it also on, on, on Instagram. For now, I I managed to find the name, as you already know, I said it a million times, exposure to other minds and stimulation. Before we wrap up today, I want to reflect a bit more. I want to paint the picture how this exposure to other minds look like in my life and how central it is actually. In order to understand what I want, sometimes I need to see options of that thing. This can go as simple as choosing an evening dress for my best friend's wedding or as complicated as creating my website. Well, maybe it is the opposite for you. Doesn't matter. What I mean is that sometimes I don't know what I like in a dress, a website I want to create, a video I want to edit, a drawing I want to make, a workshop I'm about to design and plan. And to understand what I like, basically, I need to see options of it so that I can come up with my own version. Or most of the time, it's not even about liking, but as an idea for what to create and how to create. For me, this is stimulation of our being through being exposed to other minds, which leads to an introspection. And this introspection is what gives birth to the product, feeling, plan, idea, whatever you come up with. And funny enough, stimulations do not have to be related for the end product, which is, which, which puts us directly and purely in the state of being a lover of wisdom. Reading, writing, watching, experiencing, listening to something with the pure aim of understanding it. When we drop the expectation to create something with it and to use that stimulation as only a tool and medium, we surround ourselves to understanding it. How many times have you found a dress, an item, a piece of clothing when you were not looking for it? You were just maybe window shopping, admiring the beauty, and you ended up finding a suit that you needed for that upcoming meeting. It happens to me with books most of the time. I'm in an active stimulation while I'm reading something, right? But I'm not reading with the intention of 
I'm going to make an episode about it or create content about it or use it as a tool in my coaching. I don't do that. And funny enough, when I try to do that, I cannot connect the dots. On the other hand, when I surrender to the experience of reading, watching, listening, that activity of active stimulation, I ended up finding answers in the most random lines and moments. Sometimes the answers which I didn't even remember that I was looking for. In the case of today's episode, I told you I had a connecting the dots moment while I was driving last week, but it was a realization moment for me. I didn't think or plan that I was going to record an episode about it, but then last night I read the line that I shared with you previously from designing the mind book and everything made sense. I was just purely following my passion of reading and acquiring wisdom and there you go, an internal wisdom found, was found within me. The one that I had it inside of me all this time. All it takes was a stirring of the water, the stimulation. I really love these kind of connecting the dots episodes where I talk about a recent realization which spreads among different types times of my life. I really want to share this story with you as an ending note to our discussion today. This is again a recent stimulation of mine. We have been buddy reading with a dear friend of mine. We finished it last week. It was such an interesting, maybe better to say, peculiar book. It is called Little Bick or The Fairies Parliament by John Crowley. I think that's how you pronounce his surname. It has two names, interestingly. But anyway, my translation had one name, but in English it, 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 is, it was different. The book has a sister story, I want to say. Not sister in a way that it is similar to one another, but the author used this story, used this other story as a central topic in his own book. The story is a Persian story called The Conference of the Birds. And there was a couple of quotes from it in the book that we read the in the little book. The original name of the story, The Conference of the Birds, is Mantukutayr. It's the Persian name and I was studying in high school. When I was studying in high school, we had literature classes covering up literature eras from pre-Islam to Ottoman times and after the Republic. And during our classes, I remember we studied this story. It's better to say a poem because, because it's a poem by a Sufi poet. It includes very central Persian and I want to say Islamic mythological figures and also metaphors and symbols. I'm not going to go into the whole story, of course, but I want to quickly summarize it and take us to the final message. The poem starts with a group of birds who want to choose a king or a ruler for their country. As you can imagine, there are many different types of birds. So in order to see their qualities, every one of them gives a speech about themselves. After all the speeches, the hoopoe, the wisest and the most enlightened bird, comes up to the stage and tells them, to find your ruler, you need to find the great Simorg, which lives on the Mount Kaf. In Islamic tradition, the Mount Kaf is believed to surround the earth. So it's a very central motif, just like the great bird Simorg. The hoopoe further says them, to go to the Mount Kaf and meet your leader, you need to pass the seven valleys. And the hoopoe takes all the birds onto this journey among all the seven valleys. And each valley is representing something else. I'm not going to go into it, but feel free to read about it. And as they continue this journey with all these obstacles, not all of them make it till the end. But eventually the birds who reach the Mount Kaf, where their ruler resides, the great bird Simorg, they didn't end up find what they were really looking for. What they found on the Mount Kaf was their reflections. They realized that the great bird Smirk has always been their reflection. 
Now, there is a whole deep symbolism and interpretation of this poem based on Islamic tradition and mysticism and Sufism. I'm not going to go into it, but my take on it is that all the birds listened to other birds, what they got to share, what they could learn from others. And at the end, they had to go on a journey to internalize all of it. Where they end up going at the end was no way different to themselves. They ended up coming back to themselves and to their inner wisdom. Stimulation, then introspection, takes us to remember. Stirring the water, then see what stays on the surface, takes us to remember. How do you stir your water? What are your resources of stimulation? What stays on the surface after stimulation? How can you open yourself to other minds? How can you mindfully expose yourself to other minds? How can you stay on the path of being a lover of wisdom? Where we'll end up is clear. We'll end up meeting ourselves at the end. What it matters is that how much time, effort and unlearning it takes for us to go there. As our conversation for today fades away, may you find your echoes of it that resonate within you. Thanks for listening today. This is Inner Dialogues with a Gem, a place where you discover your inner you, a place where you belong. Take care. You have so much inside of you. All it takes is to stir your water. As you pour out your mind, you're gonna get to the silence and certainty of your heart. Without getting lost and stuck in your mind, you'll be starting to take intuitive and intentional actions. Coaching is a powerful space for you to hear yourself and remember your truths. You get to hear yourself out loud with the guidance of my questions and reflections. No advice, no opinion from my side. Without getting lost in your thoughts and feelings, you're facing with your words, intentions, motives, dreams and feelings... And through that, you remember what you hold within. Let's unlearn everything that was in you and remember your truths. <laughs>